Hello, everyone. Um, this presentation will be an update on what we did in the last half a year um, regarding Iridium. I mean, as many of you know, probably we have been sidetracked by some other shiny new toy, and um, <laughs> which means that we had a few months in the beginning of this year to actually continue working on Iridium and then kind of had to quit to get this other thing done. Um, so therefore, this presentation I'll try to um, talk a little bit more about the details we didn't talk about at Congress, and we have a few new things actually in terms of hardware and software. Um, second. Okay, so I'm going to skip quickly um, over the stuff we already covered at Congress. Um, in general, it's called, this talk is about the Iridium Pager network. Um, was our main goal at the Congress to get some paging messages from Iridium decoded, and that worked kind of okay. Um, we just dissected the pager and had a look at it, but really was just special chips, nothing to find about them. One of them said Calypso, which is kind of what you expect in the GSM handset from um, somewhere in the 2000s, but it seems like the Calypso chip inside this device doesn't have much to do with the GSM Calypso, so it was kind of a dead end. Um, yeah, it's a Calypso and Iridium satellite. Now, the original idea about the Iridium network and how, why to look at it is it's a simplex system and the Iridium satellite just sends data down to you. You don't have an uplink, at least for the pager messages. So the Iridium system doesn't really know where you are and it just has to kind of guess where you are. You have to give it a rough estimate, maybe, and which is interesting if you want to receive messages and don't want to be tracked at the same time. It's um, 66 active satellites and low of orbit, um, which makes it nice to receive them because they have a rather strong signal because they're quite near to us, or I think about 600 kilometers. Um, so with rather inexpensive equipment, you can already receive them. And We'll touch on that a little bit later in the presentation. Okay. Um, Frequency-wise, it's around 1.6 gigahertz, sl slightly below GSM in the frequency spectrum. Sorry? Um, one more. Yeah, back at the Congress, we told of you, hey, um, this RF stuff, it's not that hard. It's really more kind of a myth um, that it's hard, and we just got into it, and we gave you the radios to basically dive into it also. So um, you're all satellite hackers by now. You have the equipment. Um, go have fun with it. Go have fun with our tool chain. Um, and at the beginning, we started with some RTL SDRs that didn't work really well. Um, we tried with a USRP that worked a little bit better, but uh, we still didn't get anything with the antenna we had. We bought really expensive stuff to get something going, and we spent like 200, 300 euros on, on things, and we went to the roof and got our first signals um, in the FFT, which is nice, cool. Um, there's something to decode, at least something to work on. And if you look at the waterfall, we have the SDR challenge up right now. I think the web server is broken, but in general, you're also looking for signals. For example, in the waterfall, anyone maybe who has taken part of that has seen these signals crawling through in the waterfall. And we have some very slow signals going on here, but if you read them, they're quite fast. And even if you zoom in a lot, I mean, you only have like eight milliseconds long signals, and you have to spot them. That basically was what took us the most time. Um, here you have a packet, it's a preamble, it's just a carrier, just some, a pure tone in the signal. And that's very, quite nice because you can detect that easily and you can just look at the power in the signal and detect the signal. And then a part in the packet comes which is unique. And we trigger on that in our tool chain um, to continue decoding the stuff. And here you can see a little bit of the modulation. So you have BPSK. And you can see that the blue and the red line, they go together. And you can, an RF signal, you can uh, um, decompose into two components to work with them easily. And of course, the two components can go differently or can, they can go together. If they go together in this case, um, you can transmit less information, but it's easier to decode. So that's the unique word uh, with Iridium. 
and later on the two go into different directions and that's then it contains a little bit more information that's actually where the data section is located with Iridium. At the Congress we showed you some setup and um, we just took an RTL SDR strapped on a um, low noise amplifier and got some antenna from Mauser, um, which is some electronics distributor and put it onto a um, little metallic plate and that kind of works okay but it's a lot of you know, you have to get these components and you have to solder them together and it's like a big setup. So, um, we have proved that stuff a little bit. Um, if you take an RTL SDR and just modify it a little bit and take a GPS antenna, active GPS antenna, it's the most cost efficient, cost efficient setup you can have. We optimize the tool chain also a little bit, um, it's more, more efficient and you can actually run it on a Raspberry Pi. So, if you take a Raspberry Pi version 2, put on an LCD display, add a battery and an RTL SDR, you have your mobile pager system, um, pager receiver um, right there. Um, on our wiki, um, let's see, can you switch to the, to the web browser? Okay. This is the, the wiki of the um, new CCC. Oops. <laughs> And um, we have some, some comparisons around of uh, antennas, active versus passive, which you can get uh, as commercial antennas or how to modify GPS antennas. Um, it's actually quite easy. You basically just remove a filter from a GPS antenna. You just open it and um, then basically... Oh. Sorry. There's just a, a, a big filter in the middle. Oh, crap, why is this? And if you remove this filter, your GPS antenna suddenly becomes an active iridium antenna. And with a slight modification um, on, uh, on RTL SDR, which is also documented uh, in the wiki, and it's basically just adding a, um, a small coil um, and adding an SMA connector on the side, you can get your RTL SDR to supply some power to the, um, to the GPS antenna and you get a very good signal actually out of that stuff. So what you can build with just a, a little metal box and you put the RTL stick in there and a modified GPS antenna is this thing. It's just a very small iridium and, uh, receiver. You just plug it into your notebook or plug it into a Raspberry Pi and it will give you a quite good signal um, to receive iridium pager messages. So the system is mobile, and um, oh. actually, did you skip One that? Oh yeah. And you just add a battery. Uh, you have a mobile um, receiver setup. And we've right at camp now, like an hour ago, we tested different options for receivers. So we had the RTL SDR with the active antenna, and we had a um, radio badge with a passive iridium antenna. So. Just take a radio badge, you solar on an SMA connector and you get a uh, passive antenna. It's just an off-the-shelf Iridium antenna. You can get them at Mouse or DigiKey or something like that. You just screw this thing on and you get a really nice reception. It's actually a quite good Iridium receiver. And um, even with the onboard PCB antenna here, you can just use that and still receive satellites, um, Iridium satellites actually. And we tested it, we did let it run for our half an hour and with the PCB antenna you get around 22% of all the packets that you can receive with a proper um, Iridium antenna um, and if you just look for example for the ring alert uh, channel you get around 35% of the packets which are decodable that you can also get with a quite good RTL SDR or um, the nice Iridium patch antenna and as the Pager message channel is a little bit um, stronger. You get even like 50% of all the messages on the paging channel just with your badge and the onboard antenna. So by now, um, you just load your software onto your PC, you attach the radio badge, and you can start receiving Iridium pager messages or other kinds of Iridium um, messages. So happy hacking with that. And Zach later on is going to show you how to actually run the tool chain and uh, get something out of that stuff. And yeah. So I'll uh, switch so, over to Zach, and he's going to talk a little bit more about the software. Yeah, about this picture. This is on a plane. You can even, with the mobile um, uh, Raspberry Pi version and a battery, 
receive anywhere in the world. <laughs> so we are now going to talk about the software. Uh, this is also a, a quick rehash from the from the from the Congress talk. Uh, we uh, try to find uh, stuff about the uh, iridium information, and I, I think this slide is really really great because it, it's it was on the internet without any. Uh, uh. Uh, uh, thing and it's, it's marked as confidential, and it said uh, a radium uh, a receiver is uh, probably beyond the reach of all, but mostly determined adversaries. Uh, I kind of like this. Uh, that if I read something like this, I think, hmm, maybe I can do it. Uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, some the, the first packets we received on iridium, where you can see the frequency shift as the satellite goes over your head. Uh, as it goes towards you, uh, the fre you see it at a higher frequency, and that as it goes away from you, uh, you see it at a lower frequency. And this is part of the, the reason why the, the, the Iridium slide talks about difficulty receiving, because when Iridium was built like 20 years ago, it was difficult to capture this. But with software defined radio, just say, okay, give me all the frequencies at once, and just in the, in the received signal, search for the iridium afterwards. Uh, the the uh, lines with uh, less incline, which are less steep, are satellites that are not going directly over you, but like the plane next to you over the horizon. Hello. Uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, when we uh, were decoding uh, uh, stuff. Uh, you, you do the DPSK uh, or QPSK demodulation and get lots of bits, and you spend some, quite some time staring at it, and you see some areas where well, mostly one and mostly zero, but that didn't help us. And we spent quite a lot of time uh, uh, trying to find out how, how the information is encoded. And uh, this was what last year took us, took us I think, three months. Uh, to find out that a lot of documentation on the internet we found spoke about a codec uh, of, of uh, k equals 7, rate is 3 fourths forward error correcting code, which was all wrong. Uh, uh, hand uh, sending messages with different messages to ourselves, uh, we finally found out at one point that it's uh, not, a, uh, not that code, but just a descrambling, just put the bits in a different order, and then uh, you started to see, uh, in this case, we sent ourselves uh, a message consisting of P's, and you can kind of spot them at the bottom uh, in the message, and the, the, there, there's some stuff in between, and that is supposedly a checksum, and we, the first checksum we tried, which fit the, the amount of bits it takes is a BCH checksum, uh, which needs a generator polynomial, which is a, 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 a in this case a 12-digit number, a binary number, which can just be you can just brute force and skip all the math on this and find out that yes, indeed, this is a BCH checksum with uh, 1897 as generator polynomial. Uh, and if you know what it's used, you find uh, we found one document on the on the internet talking about this kind of checksum. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the each 32 bits are divided into payload and checksum. And uh, I, on the Congress, we showed more about the um, bits, uh, separate bits, but we are further on. And uh, the final tool in our tool chain tries to go decode these messages uh, as much as possible. These are the uh, pager channel messages. Uh, uh, decoded, like the first line is, is uh, statistics, uh, which time it was received and with what confidence our decoder and at what frequency it received it. Uh, and then you see uh, uh, the LOK means that the lead out, the, the pager channel messages have a fixed bit string at the end of the message, which tells you that the packet is complete and you received it uh, correctly and that it was okay. Then there is a f another fixed string which uh, tells you, okay, this is a message uh, on the paging channel, uh, and there's not much information in it. There's like uh, the, the, the cell and the spot beam of the satellite that is actually sending it to you. 
And then there is uh, 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 an increasing number, which is, has to do with the, with the latitude of the satellite, how high above the equator it is. We, we did not reverse the number to back to the value, but it's not that interesting. Uh, <clears throat> the, the stuff we found out since Congress is we de uh, successfully decoded the ring alert channel, which is partly similar to what uh, GSM does. Uh, some people from uh, Osmocon helped us uh, very much with that. Uh, and it contains all the usual information, so which satellite it is, which cell it is, uh, the position where the satellite currently is, like latitude and longitude, and the altitude, uh, but that's not, I don't know which uh, unit this is in. Uh, the satellites also transmit in uh, every other packet the position where its spot beam supposedly hits the Earth. So you could just use uh, an iridium receiver to know where on the Earth you are because it sends you, hey, I think you are here if you receive this. And then uh, uh, this is a paging message which pages one iridium phone uh, with a Timsy of whatever and tells it, okay, I have a message for you, this phone, and then this phone, this is not for a pager, this is for a phone, and the phone connects back to the, uh, to the satellite. It says, okay, I'm here, I'm listening, give me your message. And then the satellite sends its, uh, the message on a much narrower beam directly to the phone. So you will see lots of paging messages, but you will only see uh, for messages for that phone if you're really close to it. And there's a not fully decoded other packet format, which we call data frames. And uh, the only thing we know is that there is a link control word, which is quite similar to GSM. And we can decode and verify that checksum correctly, and the rest is uh, still bits that uh, have not been decoded. Uh, we were trying to do that when we got sidetracked with the radio project. <laughs> so, why? I skip this. Uh, so you are probably all want to do it yourself with your radio badge, and uh, this is uh, I'm, I'm going to give a quick overview of the software we wrote. Um, basically, you just record the signal in your raw recording. You detect where your signal is. You cut it out into pieces, mix it down to the baseband, try the. Uh, BPSK, Q, uh, QPSK demodulation on it, get a bit stream, and then you need to, some parser decoder to make sense of all those bits um, to get the messages you saw in the previous slide. Um, rec just recording is depending on what kind of SDR you have. Every SDR has some kind of command line utility to uh, record streams. Uh, for the hacker, for the radio, you use the hacker to transfer tool. If you have an RTL SDR, uh, uh, use that line. And that, the last thing is for USRPs. Uh, we are all doing that to standard out in this case, because uh, later on I'll show you the tool which just doesn't do it with temporary files, just does it, do it in a pipe. So you just start it, and at the end you get the messages that it just receives. Uh, the, the only interesting thing maybe is the, the um, USRP command line has uh, a problem because the USRP utility also writes some diagnostic messages to standard out and you need some file descriptor trickery to get rid of that. Um, so the, detect, uh, the detector just searches the samples, the, the stream of samples from the SDR. In, uh, it calculates a rough FFT each millisecond and tries to look at the FFT and says, OK, here is a signal, because it's more, uh, the, the FFT is higher than in the previous few samples. Uh, that code is all due to Schneider. <laughs> and then it grabs that chunk of the signal and passes it on to the next utility. Uh, it also is able to detect that there is more than one peak at the same time and grab that chunk multiple times. So if there are two iridium signals at the same time at different frequencies, it can decode it that way. Uh, this is the uh, sample picture. In the upper picture, in the waterfall, you see there are multiple signals at the same time. Uh, that's probably because uh, 
you can see multiple satellites at the same time. If your setup is sensitive enough, you can see neighboring satellites also. And uh, then the next utility, uh, which uh, grabs that, modulates it to the baseband and does a filtering step. So the signal is in, uh, you have the signal clear in the middle and the other signals are on a lower level, so it can be de uh, decoded. Yeah, that's, a, that's the second utility, which uses a, a fine-grained FFT to find the exact start of the signal, because uh, the other utilities further on really like to start at the signal start and don't have any noise in front of it, and mixes it down to the baseband. It also does something which is, in theory, not necessary. It rotates the phase of the signal, so um, the signal also always starts at the same point uh, in, the, in the phase space, uh, which is, if you use proper code for the demodulation, it would not matter, but uh, since I wrote it quickly, it's uh, necessary at this point. Um, yeah, the demodulator is a homegrown QPSK demodulator, uh, which just looks at the signal and tries to decode the sig uh, symbols. It also uh, outputs uh, a confidence rating for each signal, uh, for each symbol it decodes, so at the end, it can say, OK, I think 99% of those symbols are correct, which is a good value. And if it starts to drop below 80%, you can probably just forget it and throw it away. Um, so all these utilities together, uh, you don't have to call them by hand. You use the script called multiprocessing. And it requires also uh, the, the center frequency and the rate at which you recorded the samples. And then you need to t t tell it which format the samples are in, because the HackRF, uh, the RTLSDR, and the USRP all use different type types to represent the samples. Uh, uh, the HackRF and RTL use both 8-bit, but one uses signed and one uses unsigned. Uh, that doesn't really matter, but you need to do it correctly. Uh, and that outputs uh, the, the bitstream of each packet it decodes. You could just pipe it to the next utility, the parser, which tries to make sense of the bits. But uh, uh, in reality, you might want to just write it to a file so you can look at the bits multiple times if you want to uh, see. Oh, there was an interesting message. I want to look at it again. Uh, yeah. So that's the, that's the parser, uh, which, which does whatever we know. Uh, decodes whatever we already know about the protocol. If you want to add something uh, up to about the protocol, you need to do it there. It has some special modes like dash "-o", for output format message, which just uh, parses the whole file for pager messages and tries to reassemble them because they are transmitted in, 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 in parts of uh, up to three parts, uh, uh, when, and throws away all the others. There's also some statistics modes which tell you uh, about, the, about the packet statistics and not decoding the, the rest. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, all the utilities. Uh, they're all in uh, our GitHub repository. Um, you can call them the, the two command lines to start the recording and to start the multiprocessing that I just showed you will be in the readme file shortly after the talk because I had to change something there. I will add them there. And then you can just use your radio, plug it in, start this command line, and see what, uh, what you get here. Uh, the timeline of our project was we, we started about a year ago. And uh, it took us at least uh, a month to, to find the signal in the, in the FFT. So don't get, if you, if you try to look at something in SDR, don't get discouraged too quickly if you can't even see the signal. We knew it had to be there. Uh, and we kept looking for it, and our main problem was that it was so, so short, and GNU Radio was, uh, the FFT was too slow to uh, reliably pick it up. And then we spent uh, quite some time uh, finding the, the encoding, uh, and there was the talk. There was an Osmocom meetup in uh, the, the end of March, where uh, we met some uh, really nice people from Osmocom, and uh, some of them helped us looking at more of the stuff. We spent quite some time trying to decode, uh, disassemble a DSP chip, 
which had parts of the Iridium firmware, firmware protocol implemented. And I can tell you, looking at DSP disassembly is no fun. Uh, so some kind of out of order execution that drives you mad. And in, at May 1st, uh, some guy, uh, what was his name? Dieter. Dieter? Some guy Dieter uh, bought a Rakal test set uh, somewhere, which is a test set to test Iridium handsets. And uh, we, we had a, a, a nice evening, a nice day uh, playing with it, sending signals from an Iridium phone to the test set and back so we could uh, get clean traces of the air traffic and then look at the test set what uh, it was supposed to send to the handset, so we could decode the protocol, just match it up and look for the point. Uh, he also looked at the, um, the firmware image of this thing and got even more information about, uh, about the checksums for us, uh, which we are really grateful for. Uh, that helped the uh, decode process uh, really far along. And I must admit, since then, we have kind of lingered a bit because we were busy with the radio, which was totally secretly a project to get uh, uh, 4,500 Iridium receivers into the world. <laughs> yeah, we have some, some statistics about the pager messages, same as in the Congress. The only change is there was one guy in Germany who, who sent about 16% of uh, all Iridium pager messages. They stopped. So if you now listen for pager messages, you have to wait a bit longer because the amount of messages dropped by his share by 16%. Uh, yeah, there's uh, still more to do if anyone is interested in playing with it. Uh, there's still more of the protocol uh, to understand. There's more services within the Iridium framework like short burst data and Rudix and uh, the, some aircraft communication stuff, which we haven't even touched yet. Uh, that uh, if, if anyone wants to join in, uh, we are, would be grateful. There's still a lot to do. Um, um, there's a no, that's... I changed that slide. That's from Congress, I'm sorry. Uh, the SDR workshop. We, 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 we do plan some kind of SDR workshop, maybe later today, but check the, check the wiki for that. Um, we have some equipment if you want to play with uh, SDR stuff, like a network analyzer. Um, all the code is on GitHub, uh, check the link. There's uh, still uh, there's a document called the Iridium System Specification, which would answer a lot of our questions, uh, but it's um, restricted and we could not find it. If anyone happens to come across this document, we, we still want it and we will not ask questions. and. We have our GPG keys uh, down there if you want to send it to you, to us. And uh, that concludes my part of the talk, but we have a live demo. Uh, I want to just show you how easy it is to re uh, receive something. And this, I have my, my own badge with this uh, Iridium antenna, which Schneider bought. Where did you buy it? Digikey. Digikey. Uh, and uh, I, uh, the... Some friendly person soldered an SMA connector to my badge for me because I did not have time to do it. And uh, just a second. Where is it? I probably need a bigger font. Hmm. Why doesn't this work? Uh, just uh, use the command lines I, I showed you, like uh, get the hacker if, uh, to... I need to turn it on first. 
uh, to get the samples and pipe it into there, and then we start it, and then hopefully the tent is not... Uh, And then you can get your own signals. So these are the first messages. These are not decoded, so are just the raw signals, and I'm just writing it into a file. We can use a, a second uh, terminal window. Why doesn't the resizing work on this desktop? Really strange. Uh. I think we were at F, and that's uh, we we can grab out uh, any error uh, messages and these are uh, whatever uh, came down from the from the from the air which are just uh, pager message channels uh, telling uh, the 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 pagers that everything is okay and probably that no messages because you see all zeros that no messages are there for any pages currently going down and did i have anything else so, <laughs> so this concludes our talk thank you We have, we have some time for questions. If you have any questions, uh, now would be the time. Ich weiß. Okay, if you have any questions, go to the microphones. Ask your questions. Um, kannst Hello? du das Mikro aufmachen? Hello? Um, regarding finding very short signal bursts in the FFT, have you tried uh, GR phosphor? Uh, no. I, I have been told that I should try it, but I did not. At the time we started, I did not know about it. And at the moment, I did not have the time to look into it. But uh, I was told it is uh, very good for that. Yeah, you should try it. You can see like the carrier loading in LTE signals or stuff like that. Yes. yes, TNT did some very good work um, with GeoPhosphor. It's a really great tool. Yes, actually, we have to thank a lot uh, the Osmocom guys, um, TNT, Dieter, um, Horizon, and Steve. I mean, they're very helpful and a nice team. Uh, really great guys, I have to say. I have to show you this nice uh, <laughs> antenna that Horizon built, which is because the Rhythm is also uh, circular polarized, uh, is, is, is special made for Rhythm. And uh, I think it looks really nice. And uh, whoever was at the opening talk uh, probably can think of a second use for this one. <laughs> Some more questions? No? Your last chance to ask something? Be courageous. Come to the microphone. Ask your questions about Iridium. Well, then I, then I hope you all have fun with that. Are there uh, someone? I have Please. a very, very naive and trivial question because I do not know much about this satellite network. So you told us there are 66 satellite, satellites up there. And yes. what is their uh, date of how many years they are supposed to exist, basically? Uh, how many, what do you think? Could people use it in 10 years or 20 years, what you yeah. presented here, I mean? At, uh, at the current point, uh, as far as I remember, most of the satellites are actually past their... We wanted to replace them date, but as uh, you maybe uh, noticed that Iridium went bankrupt some time a few years ago and got bought by some, some other company, which is, as far as I can tell, mostly the US Department of Defense. And they have been talking about uh, Iridium Next quite a lot, which uh, involves sending up new satellites to replace the failing ones. Uh, but as far as I can tell, they have still have not sent up any new satellites. 
uh, but they're planning to replace them as they fail. So if you look at uh, some rendering of the satellites, you see at least at one spot there's two satellites really close to each other, which is because uh, as far as we know, both of the satellites have some kind of defect and they try to keep up the service by having two half-functioning satellites next to each other. <laughs> so they're running out of satellites and have to replace them. Thanks. Did that answer your question? Basically, basically yes. And so legally, is it, is it legal to use it? I mean, you told it's... DOD in the end, but I mean, do they care if people use it? We are not using it, we're just listening to it. You can go out and buy a rhythm phone and pay for it, use it as a normal satellite phone. Uh, that is, of course, legal. Uh, I'm not sure if that was your question. Please. Going to. Uh, make a new presentation with more interesting things at the Congress, right? Yeah, we, we, we skipped over some of the stuff because uh, we wanted, we, we assumed that maybe you no, already know No, I mean, I mean, are you going to show even more stuff at the next Congress? At uh, the next Congress? Yeah. Uh, we are planning to, as we uh, leave the camp, at least I am planning to look into more of this Iridium stuff, and if we find out more interesting stuff, we, it will be presented at Congress, definitely. Excellent. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, for Iridium Next, they've been talking about it for a long time, and they are still talking about it, and yeah, we are still waiting for them to do anything about it. Um, it looks like they are doing some marketing PR, and they simply want people to believe it's going to arrive uh, like next year and next year and next year all the time. Uh, as for internet usage, you probably shouldn't spend too much time on it because it's really slow. Uh, sorry, it's really slow and pretty much no one uses it. It's too slow to be used. You get like a few kilobits per second, so it's unusable for anything which is current. Okay. It depends on your application. I mean, if you want something which doesn't have a, doesn't need a directional antenna, doesn't need to look at a specific point in the sky, works everywhere, um, then Iridium might be your choice. Or um, also it depends on, there are bundling services where they bundle um, different channels together, so you have a larger bandwidth. And I guess it's more a question of the business model at that point and how you sell the stuff. Yeah, so we'll definitely. I simply meant that you might not see that many packets, and yes. you might be unable to reverse engineer them. But well, that still uh, might be interesting. Yeah, definitely, if you can. There is data coming on. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Please, from the other side. Hi, guys. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, uh, this might be a, a little bit of a naive question, because I don't know anything about it, but... Uh, with the tool chain that you offer, is it possible to read the Iridium messages in, in clear text? Yes, they are not encrypted. Okay, so it's, these are like uh, these examples that you showed us in, in your live demo. These are just normal. Uh, these are uh, just maintenance messages right. or informations to pages. Uh, we did not show any pager messages uh, during this talk. Okay, so basically I just have to wait a little bit more, like longer. Yes. So uh, exactly. when, when a proper message occurs, it can decode it, right? Yes. Okay. Thanks, guys. Please. So now that you've distributed 4,000 Iridium receivers to all the people here, uh, what is the mechanism by which we all set these up in our hacker spaces and you capture the majority of Iridium traffic for the whole planet? Um, because that's clearly the idea, right? <laughs> you, you, you basically need the, the, um, uh, an antenna and radio with an SMA connector and some computer to run the stuff on. Uh, a Raspberry Pi 2 is just beefy enough to do it. Uh, and, uh, currently. And are, are you going to be running something to collect all of these messages uh, received from different locations? I, I, I had put my email address on there. If you send me an email, we can coordinate us. We're really interested, but we have not 
because build a central collection thing yet because uh, the radios are quite new. We have uh, one or two outposts, but uh, those are running manually at the point. Because with this many receivers distributed around the planet, surely we could receive at least yes. a large fraction. So if you plan to set up like a receiver at your hackerspace, totally send us an email and we will coordinate the, the passing of uh, the data and see what interesting things emerge in different regions of the world. Thank you. Thanks. Um, please, from this side. Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, now that we have all these badges that have a processor inside, have you thought the idea of integrating your code here? Is it possible? Does it have the processing power? That's a good question. Um, so at that point, you might be limited by the processing power on the batch to pick up or to pick up the little signals in a complete spectrum. I mean, what we do on the PC is number crunching the whole thing and just look at, okay, where is some uh, activity and then just look at this part, look at this part, look at this part. And obviously the original Iridium receivers uh, or pages, they track the satellites, they track their frequency and they know exactly when to listen for them. So if you create an algorithm to do that, I'm pretty sure that the batch is powerful enough to be a standalone Iridium pager. Yes. Thank you. But not with the current tools. Please. Um, it's very clear that uh, by basis of the Iridium system, they did not think about uh, this being cracked at any point. Um, is there a realistic upgrade scenario for them that does not include replacing all hardware on Earth? Um, the Iridium pager system is kind of uh, discontinued. It's not that easy to get a new contract for an Iridium pager. They are kind of phasing it out. There is a, the short burst data stuff, which is much more complex. And I suspect there might be some encryption on it. We have not looked at it. And modern pagers, there are standalone things that do internet and paging stuff on it. And they use short burst data for uh, everything. So they are migrating away from this. But there are still a lot of pagers out there. Yeah, and I would still uh, uh, expect that any, any data transmitted over Iridium is unencrypted unless the um, handset or the, um, the mobile terminal you're using is special and actually does some encryption. Um, but who knows? Okay, yeah. thank you. Can I, can I interject something? If you want to play with your badges, we are running also an SDR contest. Uh, if you look at the radio wiki, you find a link to the contest, which encourages you to try different things on your radio and run around at the camp a little bit, maybe after the sun goes down. Uh, you just should all just look into it. That's really fun, I hope. Please. Okay, so I maybe can add a little bit of information that might help answer some of the previous questions. Um, regarding service life, that's totally correct. Most of the satellites are already behind their projected life cycles. And um, since it's a LEO system, not a GEO system, unfortunately, you can't replace them one by one. You essentially have to replace the entire system. Next gen, as correctly pointed out before, is uh, economically unfeasible at this point in time. At least there is no commercial business case. So the entire thing depends on whether the US DOD will fund it or not in the next uh, in the very near future, and at the moment it looks bad. Um, second, uh, you had a question about altitude, I believe. Um, from the numbers I've seen, that should be the altitude in kilometers above the WGS-84 idealized uh, Earth model. I, so, yeah. I think I tried this to plot this once and it did not completely match up, but I don't really remember it that uh, it should be around 780 kilometers. Uh, yes, yes, but that, so. the, the, the numbers had greater variation than I expected them to. As the spares do, of course, fly higher or lower, but, um, well, different, different topic. Yeah. Um, and the last one was, uh, yeah, right data. Um, one of the previous uh, um, guys here uh, said correctly that uh, hardly anyone uses the normal data service because it delivers only 2.4 kilobit per second. Um, I just might add, um, there are actually only two data services on Iridium that are worth talking about at this point in time. It's either the Maritime version, where they use channel bundling to uh, yield at least halfway acceptable data rates that you can use for anything if you have continuous stream of data. 
And the other thing is, of course, SBD short burst data, short burst data, and that's really used for a lot of things, especially fleet tracking. That I think would be something really interesting uh, to look into uh, for future research. And about yes. the aircraft traffic stuff, uh, we have to talk. Yes. So the the thing is that I mean, you have you have to start somewhere and get some idea on how this stuff works and the protocol is working. Um, we started with pager messages. I mean, they're really the simplest thing to get into, and they're quite strong. And the further you look into such a system as Iridium, you get to know a little bit about more of its details, and you start to make more sense about the stuff which made no sense before. So you have to slowly go forward and, and poke a little bit around to see where you go. And obviously, um, interest is in SBD, for sure. Um, and we'll have to see where this will lead. Yes. So, if, mm, is your, yeah, your question seems to be answered. So, if no one else wants to ask something or have a comment on it, then I really would like to thank you guys for this excellent talk. Thanks.